All right, good afternoon. The Secretary General is now on his way back uh, to New York, where he'll be arriving later this afternoon. As you know, he was in Berlin, and yesterday he took part in the Libya conference hosted by German Chancellor Angela Merkel. The Secretary General welcomed the commitment by the member states present, including all five permanent members of the Security Council, to refrain from interfering in the armed conflict or Libya's internal affairs. He said that countries, along with regional and international organizations, sent a strong signal that they are, quote, fully committed to supporting the peaceful resolution to the Libyan crisis. He reiterated that there is no military solution for the Libyan conflict and urged all Libyan parties to engage in a Libyan-owned and Libyan-led dialogue under the auspices of the United Nations, paving the way for a political solution. At the conference, all participants committed to supporting the ceasefire and to put pressure on the parties to the conflict for a full ceasefire to be reached. Uh, his remarks uh, were shared with you yesterday. Uh, and on Yemen, you will have seen that the Secretary General Special Envoy Martin Griffiths condemned the escalation in military activities. He said he was particularly concerned by the aerial attacks that reportedly hit Al Istikbal military camp in Marib City, which reportedly killed dozens of people. Mr. Griffiths reiterated that the hard-earned progress that Yemen has made on de-escalation is very fragile, stressing that such actions can derail the process, derail this progress. He urged all parties to stop the escalation and now and to direct their energy away from military front into pol politics. His full statement is online, and Mr. Griffiths has been actively engaged in the last 24 hours with all parties. He's expressed his alarm uh, over tragic events and urged the participants to remain calm and to avoid any further escalation. And turning to Iraq, in a statement issued earlier today, Janine hennis Pashut, the special representative of the Secretary General in Iraq, urged the government of Iraq to initiate a renewed push for reform and express concern about ongoing human rights violations. With demonstrations across many parts of Iraq in their fourth month, she emphasized the need, the importance of pressing ahead to meet the needs of the Iraqi people. The killing and injury of peaceful protesters, combined with years of undelivered promises, have resulted in major crisis of confidence, she said, adding that the violent suppression of peaceful protests is intolerable and must be avoided at all costs. The special representative said that geopolitical developments, namely the escalation in regional tensions, must not eclipse the rightful demands of the Iraqi people. And the Security Council uh, held close consultations this morning on Cyprus. They were, council members were briefed by Elizabeth Spehar, the special representative and head of the mission in Cyprus, and I know she spoke to you afterwards. Uh, following a six-day visit to Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory, Ursula Mueller, the Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator and Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, called on the international community to ensure continued commitment and sustained funding to help alleviate the challenges faced by Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Ms. Mueller was the keynote speaker of the sixth International Conference on Preparedness and Response to Emergency and Disasters that was held in Tel Aviv. During her visit, she met with Israeli authorities, commended uh, Israel on its contributions to global emergency relief efforts. In the occupied Palestinian territory, Ms. Mueller met with the Prime Minister of the State of Palestine and the Director General of Palestinian Civil Defense to identify areas for strength and cooperation. She visited the Central West Bank, where she met with vulnerable communities who are exposed to coercive environments that reduces their access to shelter, basic services, and natural resources, placing them at risk of forcible transfer. And she was also in Gaza, where she visited the Al-Shifa Hospital, a women's center where vulnerable women and men receive support, and she also met youth leaders. She said that member states must continue to support humanitarian assistance in Gaza and the West Bank. At the same time, they must work to rekindle a robust political dialogue and promote long-term solutions to address the root causes of the crisis. And over the weekend, Rosemary DiCarlo, the Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, concluded a the visit to five African countries, Senegal, Guinea-Bissau, Niger, Nigeria, and Burkina Faso. In meetings with national and regional leaders, she discussed the pressing issues of peace and security and development. She held consultations with UN country teams on the humanitarian situation in ways to further strengthen 
our support through enhanced strategic uh, partnership and regional with regional organizations such as the Economic Community for West Africa and the G5 Sahel. More information on a press release, and then Mr. Carlo joined the Secretary General in Berlin for the Libya conference. Uh, staying in um, West Africa, the humanitarian coordinator in Nigeria, Edward Cologne, has strongly condemned the attacks on Saturday evening by non-state armed groups against the main accommodation for aid workers in Angala in the northeastern state of Borno. Five UN staff were staying there at the time of the attack. Aid workers are providing assistance to more than 55,000 people in Angala, which borders Cameroon. Uh, and we are continuing with our partners to help more than 7 million people in the crisis-affected states of Borno, Ademawa, and Yobe. But there are, humanitarian workers are increasingly the target of attacks. And from Paris, our colleagues at UNESCO said that while the number of journalists killed worldwide dropped by nearly half in 2019, they continue to face risks and perpetrators enjoy almost total impunity for these crimes. UNESCO recorded 56 killings of journalists last year, the lowest annual toll in more than a decade. In total, 894 journalists have been killed in the decade from 2010 to 2019. Most journalists have been killed outside of the conflict zones. Audrey Azoulay, UNESCO's Director General, said the agency remains deeply troubled by hostility and violent directed, violence directed at all too many journalists around the world. She added that as long as the situation lasts, it will undermine democracy. And our colleagues at the World Health Organization say that tobacco smokers who undergo surgery face higher risks of post-surgical complications than non-smokers. These include impaired heart and lung functions, among others. However, a new joint study done by WHO and a number of partners shows that smokers who quit approximately four weeks or more before surgery have a lower risk of complications and better results six months afterwards. And UNICEF today launched a paper that says that nearly one in three adolescent girls from the world's poorest households have never been to school. The paper in entitled Addressing the Learning Crisis, an Urgent Need to Better Finance Education for the Poorest Children, highlight major disparities in the distribution of public education, spending and calls for more equal allocation of resources. Looking at 42 countries, the paper finds that education for children from the richest 20% of households are allocated nearly double the amount of education funding than children from the poorest 20% of households. And tomorrow I will be joined again by Elliot Harris, the UN Chief Economist and Deputy uh, and Assistant Secretary General at DESA, and along with Marta Roig, the Chief of Emerging Trends and Issues in DESA. They will be here to brief you on the launch of the 2020 World Social Report. And we are bounding along on the honor roll. We welcome today fresh cash from Canada, Netherlands, and, the S and Switzerland, which brings us up to 14. 14. If it's simple enough, I will answer the question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Staff, could you give us some more details on what to expect uh, later this week in Geneva on the Libya ceasefire negotiations? Is it this week? I mean, do we have a date? And uh, what's the format? I, to, Mr. Know? Salame, uh, I think we'll um, we'll try to to organize organize this as um, as soon as possible, and as soon as we have details, we'll share with you. Uh, we do expect the Secretary General to uh, brief the Security Council at their request uh, either tomorrow or Wednesday. That will likely be in closed consultations where he will report back on his, uh, on his discussions in Libya. Thank you. Thank you. Also on Libya, uh, does the Secretary General think the Security Council should act on this in the nearest future to make it uh, legally binding? Well, I think it's up to the Security Council to see how they want to endorse it, but I have no doubt that they will take that up. Edie. Uh, two other follow-ups on Libya. Uh, first, um, in eastern Libya today, there has been a freeze on oil production ordered by Khalifa Hiftar's forces, which does not seem to bode well uh, for what happened in Berlin. Does the Secretary General have any comment on this? And um, well, try that first. <laughs> okay, I'll give it a try. Uh, 
obviously, I think those these developments on the ground are of, uh, of concern to us. The issue of uh, the oil of Libya, the economy of uh, Libya, is will be addressed in one of the tracks uh, laid out by Mr. Salome on the that focuses on the economy. But the uh, the the the, the um, resources of Libya. Uh, should obviously be going uh, to uh, the benefit of the Libyan people themselves. Um, secondly, um, on the um, preparations or what might happen in the future, obviously the Security Council would have to give any okay for a new UN peacekeeping force. But with this as a serious possibility. Um, is DPKO doing any preparatory work for this sure. possibility? I mean, we're, we're always looking at uh, contingency planning and, and making plans for uh, what what the Security Council may call on us uh, to do, including uh, you know ways we can increase our ability uh, to report back on, uh, on ceasefires. Joe, and then Yes, uh, on Yemen, um, does the UN have any more details from its in-country presence uh, on the attack, who launched the attack, uh, the kind of weaponry that was involved, et cetera? I mean, the speculation that it came from the Houthis, but uh, has it been no, any we confirmation? No, we don't have any, uh, any more forensic information on, on the, uh, what was used in this aerial attack and, uh, and who may have been responsible uh, for it. These are. Uh, on Lebanon, it seems there's, there are escalations everywhere in Beirut and other areas, if, uh, clashes between the police and protesters. Uh, do you have any statements regarding that? Look, we're obviously uh, concerned by what we're seeing on the streets of Lebanon, uh, about the violence during the protests over the weekend. Uh, Obviously, we urge all parties to refrain from violence, and it's very important that security forces be there to protect peaceful protesters and to refrain themselves from using disproportionate uh, force. And uh, we also call on Lebanon's political leadership to advance government formation to maintain stability and facilitate efforts to mitigate the impact of the financial crisis. Well, up in that um, last week, Mr. Um Kubish issued a statement praising the governor of the Bank of, of Lebanon for his leadership or for being active, whereas other politicians have failed the country. Uh, is he in the business of rating central bank governors, especially that this figure in Lebanon is very controversial and many people think, are accusing him uh, of connivance uh, for, with corruption? He, Mr. Uh, Kubish issued a uh, posted a tweet with a photo after the meeting. Uh, I think you're uh, analyzing the words, but I would refer you to what he actually said, which is pretty self-explanatory. And Mr. Kubish has been acting within his mandate. Well, he said, that, he, said, he said it seems that the central bank governor is the only person who is working. He said what he said. Yes, Stefano. Yes, yes again on Libya. Um, on the... Um, when they say, uh, you know, that the participant commit to refraining from interferences, is this include also when the government, the one recognized by the UN in Tripoli, ask for, uh, let's say, when it did ask to Turkey to uh, send a force in in the countries, this include that as I think, the, I think the, me the message uh, that we've heard from the Secretary General that you, you can have seen from Berlin, that we heard from Mr. Salome here, is pretty clear that uh, Turkey does not need, uh, let me rephrase that. The message is pretty clear, and that is that Libya does not need any, uh, any more uh, foreign interference from whatever quarter that may So that include may that. And then and the point of human rights, it says, um, who says, in the in the, the final declaration in the oh, communique yeah. of the conference, um, that they will uh, end to the practice of. I mean, they call for the, the Libyan authority. 
to handle the process of arbitrary detention and then gradually close the detention centers for migrant sets. This gradually, because you know, gradually can mean many things, can mean in a month, can mean one year. Why gradually? I mean, what does it mean gradually? Well, gradually would mean as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. So uh, quickly as possible. Obviously, and, uh, and to ensure the safety uh, and dignity of those who are inside the detention centers. Madam. It's Anna from Armenia. Thank you. I have two questions. One is about coronavirus uh, that's spreading in China. They say it's very similar to SARS virus and has a potential of global pandemic. Is UN monitoring the situation? Are there any warnings? What's your other question? And my other question is about climate refugees, which is uh, relatively a new term. It's been determined by UN Commission that climate refugees cannot be returned to the place of their birth. And this was decided on a national of Kiribati, but uh, taking into consideration global warming, this can become a very uh, disastrous issue for the future. Uh, is UN thinking about this? Uh, yes, assessing? clearly. I mean, and the Secretary General has spoken about it. This is something, I mean, I think the, the decision by the Human Rights uh, Committee uh, was a very important one. Obviously, will have to be uh, and will have to be studied. But it is clear that it is something that the world is going to have to grapple with. Uh, on your first one, I would refer you to the many statements that WHO has put out uh, in the past uh, in the past few days. Uh, they are clearly monitoring it very closely, working with authorities in um, in China. Uh, they had a team on the ground in uh, in Wuhan, uh, and uh, they are obviously very much on top of it. And Bill, thank you. I'm back to Lebanon. <clears throat> um, more than 400 people were injured in the recent. Uh, uh, protests and maybe clashes in the streets of Beirut. And it seems that uh, the security forces are using um, a different or new uh, gas, tear gas. Uh, um, and uh, a lot of uh, people who were injured uh, describe these uh, uh, gases as like toxic gases. Do you have any, any information about that and any message that you can uh, send to the authorities about also accountability? I don't have any details uh, on, the, on the report you say, but we have seen um, violence over the, over the weekend. Uh, security forces, whether it's in Lebanon or any other countries, should be there to protect protesters who, are, who have a, uh, a right to demonstrate peacefully. Uh, violence from protesters and and uh, and, um, and vandalism is of course unacceptable. Uh, but what we have seen are the vast majority of peaceful protesters, and they need to be protected. Any violence against them needs to be investigated, and those who instigate the violence need to be held to account. Caro Stefano, grazie mille. Um, again on migrants, but this time. On the other side of Mediterranean Greece, there is the, in the highland of uh, Lesbos, the um, West Lesbos Municipal Council voted to close the stage two transit camp. Uh, this is going to take place in, in a few days, of, uh, January 31st. Now, this is a camp that the UNHCR is a transit facility, but it looks like it's, that he is very, very important to keep it open because it's the is the, the thousands, thousands of people pass there and get the first help. Now, what the what the UN is. Uh, well, I, I think you know in, in detail. I think it's something you need to check with UNHCR to see what the situation is on the ground and what contingency plans they may have. What is clear is that uh, Greece uh, has shown an immense uh, solidarity and generosity with uh, the migrants and refugees that have been coming in. And whether it's Greece or other countries on the Mediterranean, uh, we've always said that there needs to be greater solidarity from other countries uh, in Europe as well. Thank you. Oh, Nizar, the let's go. Thing about you were Iraq gone for so long that I missed you. Oh, thank you. Uh, violence in Iraq, it seems in many cities nowadays, roadblocks yeah. and uh, clashes are happening almost everywhere in the south in particular. 
Do you have any statement on that? Uh, Nizar, I'm happy to welcome you back, but if, I think the second or third item I read was a statement just on that issue, so I'll share you what I just read. Thank you.